And good evening to everyone. This is Dr. Bill Tulo, Chief Medical Officer at Oculus, and I'm excited to bring you a presentation tonight, Optimizing Evo ICL Surgery with the Oculus Panicam with Dr. Stephen Greenstein. Before I introduce Dr. Greenstein, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have questions, please submit them in the chat, and we will save some time at the end to get to your questions. I am really excited tonight on this topic, and you guys will find out why shortly. But let me introduce Dr. Greenstein. As, um, Dr. Greenstein is a graduate of Harvard Medical School Cornea Refractive and External Disease Fellowship at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. He's currently medical director at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus. He's authored articles and book chapters on corneal crosslinking as the co-inventor of corneal tissue addition keratoplasty, or better known as CTAC. Dr. Greenstein is board certified in ophthalmology and refractive surgery, and he's a clinical assistant professor at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. He's a member of several ophthalmology societies and serves as an ophthalmologist for the New York Jets football team, who are 0-1. Oh, we, um, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, coming from a Dolphins fan, I couldn't help but say that. Um, so let's start the program, Stephen. I'm going to hand it over to you, and let's take it off. Thanks, uh, Bill, and uh, I appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, from the uh, Thursday Night Dolphins game then to uh, to do this uh, this webinar. Um, exactly. But uh, tonight we're going to talk about, as Dr. Tulo said, uh, optimizing uh, the Evo ICL surgery uh, with the Oculus uh, Pentacam. And so just to take a step back of kind of where we are in the US uh, today, uh, Evo ICL, which uh, we have been eagerly awaiting for many years uh, in the US, uh, was FDA approved uh, in 2022. And the main difference uh, between the Evo ICL and the original uh, Vizian ICL was the central port or the uh, central hole that was placed in the lens it's about 0.36 uh, millimeters, and it allows for the flow of aqueous uh, from the anterior chamber uh, to the posterior chamber, uh, which uh, both uh, facilitates hydration of the crystalline lens, and most importantly, uh, as we'll see, allows for uh, better IOP control uh, in the eye. So one of the greatest things for our patients uh, with the EVO lens was that these patients no longer required uh, peripheral iridotomies uh, to have the ICL placed. And while having a PI uh, doesn't seem like much, uh, anybody who did the PIs for the ICL uh, would definitely uh, beg to differ on that. Uh, the old requirement was to have uh, two peripheral iridotomies in each eye. These were young patients, frequently with uh, thick brown uh, irises, uh, we would get hyphemas uh, before surgery that would have to be treated. Uh, patients really hated going through uh, the uh, iridotomy process. It added to the whole process of having the lens placed. So really, the uh, now that we don't need to do uh, iridotomies has really uh, allowed uh, the ICL to join uh, the uh, refractive surgery market and our refractive surgery options uh, in a really meaningful and, and large way. And not so insignificantly behind that uh, really has been the less uh, risk of cataract formation, as we'll also discuss, uh, which has been found with the EVO uh, lens. So uh, with the uh, aqueous fluid uh, moving through the lens with, like I said, better hydration of the crystalline lens, uh, one of the things that we have found um, is uh, significantly less cataract formation. And where that was a real uh, issue that needed to be discussed, especially with our younger patients, um, really now it's, it's not, it's barely something that we uh, mention uh, at all. So the uh, EVO ICL is approved uh, for myopia uh, in the US. Uh, it is available uh, for, in lower powers and for hyperopia outside the US, but in the US it is available for uh, myopia from about minus three uh, to minus 15 diopters. Now in the uh, glasses plane, the spectacle plane, that actually can correct uh, close to minus 20 diopters. So a really, really wide range of correction that you can get uh, with the uh, EVO lens. 
and the with the Evo lens also came the uh, FDA approval of toric uh, implants uh, from one to four diopters. And again, that was a massive uh, improvement for ICL surgery uh, because most of our refractive patients or many of our refractive patients do have an astigmatic uh, component to their correction. And they frequently uh, would require the ICL and then some form of laser vision uh, correction to uh, correct for their astigmatism. And now with the toric lenses, uh, we can correct both all at once. It's approved for ages uh, 21 uh, to 45 years old. Uh, I would say again, with the Evo lens, uh, we are definitely pushing the envelope on those numbers. Uh, we have started to extend off-label use uh, to patients who are older than 45. And in some ways it's really filled uh, a nice niche in that age range because with some a blended vision, some mini monovision, uh, but still with patients who have uh, some level of accommodation, um, you don't need to do refractive lens exchange uh, for these patients. You can do the ICL uh, procedure, uh, correct their myopia, still uh, give them a blended vision. And the nice thing about it is uh, you can talk to patients uh, by telling them that when they do need cataract surgery eventually, maybe 20 years down the road, uh, the uh, implantable lens can be removed and you really have any IOL option open to you because we haven't uh, changed anything about the anatomy of uh, the eye. We haven't changed anything about the curvature of the cornea. So uh, multifocal IOLs um, and any future uh, IOL technology um, is going to be uh, open to you uh, with the ICL. It is approved for anterior chamber depth uh, that is greater than three millimeters. Importantly, this is internal anterior chamber depth so this is from the endothelium uh, posteriorly, uh, does not include the corneal thickness. Again, outside the US, it's actually approved for 2.8 millimeters uh, and above. And within the US, uh, more and more surgeons have uh, been considering uh, and felt more comfortable uh, going down to that uh, uh, measurement uh, off-label. There's also uh, endothelial requirements uh, for the ICL. Uh, as you can see from the chart to the right, uh, the endothelial requirements are, are pretty high. Um, and these were the original requirements uh, in the original FDA trial. They have not been changed. These are still uh, the uh, requirements uh, from an FDA standpoint to place the lens. Um, I would say with a lot more data that we've had over the years um, and really minimal cases, if any at all, of uh, corneal failure or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy uh, from these lenses, I think there has become similar to uh, anterior chamber depth, a comfort level of uh, placing these sulcus lenses uh, with uh, lower uh, endothelial cell counts than this chart. Um, and I know there's been some movement to, to try to move away from it uh, entirely, uh, but right now these are uh, the uh, FDA required uh, endothelial accounts for uh, ICL placement. So these were the original results uh, for ICL. This is for the Vizian ICL uh, originally. And, and you can see that in the original FDA trial, uh, the majority of the patients uh, that were treated uh, were really at very uh, high degrees of myopia. So at these levels of myopia, uh, the vision of 2040 or better uh, was excellent, uh, well above 95% uh, in most cases, and definitely above 90%. And vision uh, of 2020 or better decreased with the level of myopia uh, that was being treated. And, and this makes sense, as we've seen from a lot of our higher uh, myopic patients. Uh, those patients uh, tend not to always correct to 2020 to begin with. They have other uh, issues with uh, myopic fundus. Um, as well as they have uh, frequently an astigmatism associated uh, with, their, uh, with their vision. Um, but in general, uh, the correction uh, was, uh, was very good with the original lens. But then we moved on to the EVO uh, clinical trial, and these were the six-month results from the uh, FDA trial. And if we look at the eyes that were included in this trial, uh, the mean spherical equivalent uh, for the ICL lens was about a minus a 7.6, with the median being 7.3. So uh, still a higher degree of myopia than your average LASIK patient, um, but more moderate than, uh, than in the past. 
And you can really see how excellent uh, the results from the uh, EVO lens uh, for uncorrected vision was. And this is really similar to any refractive surgery uh, that we currently are uh, offering to our patients. So over 97% uh, of patients um, had vision of 2025 or better, over 99% 2030 or better, uh, and almost 90% uh, 2020 or better um, vision after the lens. So really, really excellent uh, visual results. Over time, over the six month period, you can see that the uh, spherical equivalent and the refraction remain very, very stable, uh, which, uh, which is really key. And I think one of the things to highlight about the EVO ICL lens and, uh, and phacic lenses in general, is that one of the advantages that phacic lenses uh, likely offers is uh, potentially some more long-term stability uh, in refraction over time. Because one of the things that we know uh, from our experience with laser correction and LASIK and PRK is that when we reshape the cornea in myopia, when we make the cornea flatter, uh, what happens over time is we get epithelial remodeling and you can see in the picture on the left uh, that yellow area of epithelial thickening and with that thickening uh, comes some degree of uh, myopia so that is one of the main contributing factors we have found over the years uh, to myopic regression and generally the higher corrections the flatter we've made the cornea the more epithelial remodeling that we see and so the more chance of seeing some of this myopic uh, regression uh, down the road. So we all know that in some of our higher myopic uh, patients, it's not uncommon to see that over the years, uh, their refraction will be minus one, even minus two. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with epithelial remodeling. And most of our patients accepted that because uh, when they were a minus eight or minus nine, uh, to be a minus one or minus two was still extremely liberating. Uh, but with the phacic lenses and with the EVO ICL, the chances that we're going to see epithelial remodeling really shouldn't happen because we're not changing anything about the curvature of the cornea. And that does take away one major uh, area where we get myopic change in patients over time uh, and myopic regression. So long-term stability with this lens uh, may actually be higher uh, in certain uh, cases. And one of the really uh, great things uh, with this lens was the stability of intraocular pressure. So anybody who used the original uh, ICL lenses uh, can tell you about some of the uh, battles with early pressure spikes uh, with the lens um, and even with uh, frustration where uh, patients' uh, pressures uh, could rise over time, particularly if their vaults were a little bit on the higher side. But now there, the, there's such a better tolerance uh, of these lenses with really a remarkably stable uh, intraocular pressure, pressure in the FDA trial. So you can see that the pressure really stayed around 16 uh, from pre-op all the way out uh, to six months. And we've seen uh, that stability uh, last way past uh, six months in, in our experience. One of the other challenges uh, with ICL surgery uh, is sizing the lens. So uh, the one of the things that we really spend a lot of time doing is taking accurate measurements uh, of the anterior segment to make sure that we choose the ICL that comes in the proper width. And the ICL currently in the US is available in four uh, widths. And you want to choose the one that's going to best fit uh, for your patient uh, because that is going to determine uh, the vault. That's going to determine uh, how uh, narrow the angle might be after the surgery and how much distance you have uh, between the ICL and the uh, crystalline lens. And there are multiple things that you have to measure, which we'll go over uh, tonight. And one of the nice things uh, with the Pentacam is that particularly with the Pentacam AXL Wave, we can actually measure all of these, uh, uh, all of the necessary uh, requirements uh, for the uh, STAR calculator uh, with uh, this one uh, device. So it's a really, really unique uh, tool uh, to be able to help us plan ICL surgery. 
So the uh, Pentacam AXL Wave uh, really does five main things. So we're uh, all accustomed to the Pentacam and the Pentacam HR, uh, which does shine flug uh, imaging. That's uh, the backbone of many of our, our refractive uh, practices. But the AXL Wave uh, adds uh, refraction, uh, auto refraction, wavefront refraction, and particularly uh, aberrometry. So wavefront aberrometry, which differentiates between corneal uh, higher order aberrations and internal uh, higher order aberrations. Uh, so it can be a, a really great uh, tool uh, for assessing uh, the visual quality of our patients. It provides a retro illumination image, axial length, which can be uh, used for uh, biometry measurements, uh, so it really does all of this, uh, all of these different measurements now in one device. So this is actually uh, our technician uh, using uh, the AXL Wave. And uh, I didn't speed this up. This is pretty much uh, doing the uh, measurements on one eye in real time. So it starts uh, with doing the uh, wavefront uh, refraction. Um, and that's uh, what's being done uh, now at the same time as when it does the wavefront refraction, it's going to take uh, a retro illumination uh, image, uh, which I have found actually invaluable in educating our, our patients on why we make certain decisions uh, about surgery and particularly uh, with uh, cataract surgery. You can then uh, take your axial length measurements, which you don't need axial length measurements to determine the EVO ICL or the measurements of the ICL, but I actually find having baseline axial length measurements to be very helpful uh, for all of our patients because when you do see uh, sometimes myopic change um, and you're not sure where it's coming from and it's not clearly epithelial, it's nice to have the reassurance that there isn't, although very unlikely to see axial change, that there hasn't been axial change over time. Uh, and then you get your uh, traditional uh, tomography measurements, which we are all used to. And that can all be, be done uh, really in less than two minutes. So you're generating almost an entire anterior segment ocular exam uh, in less than two minutes uh, with the device uh, for one eye. And Oculus has done a great job at really uh, creating this visual sequence overview, which really gives you a tremendous amount of information about the anterior segment uh, all on one page. I, I find this to be an incredibly helpful tool uh, for refractive uh, surgery evaluations because you can really look at this one page and it really highlights kind of different things that might be that you might be looking at. Uh, and might strike you uh, to be a better or a worse candidate for refractive surgery while still having the ability to go back into the device and really look at a deeper level uh, at all of these measurements. So here's an example where patient comes in we, for refractive uh, evaluation uh, because they've had a decrease in vision and very easy to spot without even examining the patient yet uh, what this patient's problem is. This patient has cataract, has cortical cataract, and it's a very uh, useful educational tool uh, because we can show the patient you're not a good candidate for refractive surgery in, uh, in laser correction or ICL, but you are, and we can refractively uh, correct you with refractive cataract surgery. Same thing here, we can highlight and it, uh, pick out very uh, quickly uh, that this patient has a mild keratoconus uh, that we're looking at, and because of that, uh, they're not going to be good candidates for a typical uh, refractive surgery uh, and are going to need uh, some alternative uh, forms of treatment, which is easy to identify, easy to educate, um, and then uh, review options with your patients. So I just want to go through this overview a little bit uh, deeper because some of these measurements are what we're going to go over uh, for the ICL calculations uh, as well. So in the top right corner, you're going to get your uh, wavefront uh, refraction, uh, a photopic, scotopic, um, and a general uh, refraction uh, that's listed uh, there. So we can get uh, easy uh, to look at those numbers very quickly. Then we get our keratometry uh, values uh, so we can assess corneal astigmatism and how the corneal astigmatism uh, matches with uh, the refractive astigmatism. We then move to something that's called the corneal properties. Uh, we have the corneal thickness measurements, of course, 
Um, and one of the things I want to highlight in the corneal properties uh, is particularly the bad D analysis. So this can be a quick uh, reference tool to uh, flag abnormality in the cornea, pathology in the cornea, and particularly irregular astigmatism from uh, keratoconus, which is critical for our, any of our refractive evaluations to be able to identify uh, who might be at risk for ectasia and who might have or be at risk uh, for keratoconus. So if we dive a little deeper into this analysis, which is available on the Pentacam, uh, uh, multiple Pentacam devices, uh, this is really a regression analysis, which uh, highlights anterior elevation, posterior elevation, uh, as well as the pachymetry profile uh, of each patient's cornea. And it does all of this to develop a D-score, which is then compared to a normative database. Uh, and that D-score uh, is then either normal, one standard deviation out of the norm, uh, or uh, over two standard deviations out of the norm, which indicates that there is likely pathology that you're looking at. One important thing for the uh, bad analysis is you need to make sure that the correct refraction is highlighted, which you can see down at the bottom right. So most of our refractive candidates are myopes, and that tends to be the default selection. But if you're looking at a hyperope or someone with mixed sill, you do need to make sure that that was selected uh, because patients who will flag as a standard deviation out of the norm, but actually have a hyperopic refraction um, are frequently have a normal a D score. And our technicians or staff that are doing this a scan uh, don't usually pick up on that uh, to make that change for, the, uh, for those patients. So you do wanna make sure that you are looking at the correct uh, refraction there. You can see here, bottom left is the tomography uh, images, uh, which highlight a, a mild inferior steepening with some mild elevation changes. And the bad analysis very uh, quickly uh, shows you that this uh, patient's cornea is at least one standard deviation out of the norm. So it is not necessarily uh, abnormal, uh, but certainly somebody who you want to look twice at uh, before doing any kind of LASIK uh, correction. And finally, patients who have true pathology, uh, particularly keratoconus, um, are going to highlight uh, in red uh, two standard deviations out of the norm. Um, and these patients obviously are uh, a different uh, discussion entirely. Uh, in terms of vision correction and uh, stability. So that's really looking at corneal properties. It's a very uh, quick way on the uh, visual uh, sequence overview to see whether and highlight whether there is some uh, potential abnormality in the cornea. And then as we work our way down, we work to some of the important ICL measurements uh, in particular, um, and those are particularly highlighted around anterior chamber depth and the horizontal white to white. So anterior chamber depth is important because as we discussed earlier, the FDA approval for the EVO ICL requires a three a millimeter anterior chamber depth. And one of the nice things uh, on the Pentacam is it actually, uh, it actually shows you uh, an internal and an external anterior chamber depth. So we are particularly interested in the internal uh, depth. You don't have to do any math. You don't have to look at the corneal thickness and then subtract it from the anterior chamber. You get the number right there, very quick, very easy to look at. And if you see somebody has a shallow anterior chamber, even if uh, they have the myopia that would uh, be uh, adequate for ICL surgery, um, you can quickly uh, decide that they may not be uh, the best candidate for ICL. The horizontal white to white, um, as we'll discuss, is very, very important for sizing. So from the STAR calculator, the horizontal white to white is really uh, one of the main uh, and really the main um, measurement that is used uh, to determine the sizing of the ICL. And the original trials were done using manual calipers um, and everything since has been really compared uh, to that because the calculator itself is, is based off of those manual calipers. So one of the things about the Pentacam and there's some data uh, that's going to be coming out uh, soon uh, about this is the Pentacam gives you uh, and we've seen this in our practice, a very, very accurate horizontal white to white, very, very similar uh, to your manual caliper measurements. I, I am shocked actually, um, and I try to actually do the manual calipers without looking at the Pentacam's white to white so I can really compare them. I have been shocked at how close uh, those numbers are. And both it's reassuring to your measurement, but also incredibly helpful to have that measurement automated uh, for uh, ICL uh, sizing. One of the opposite things happened uh, with uh, 
our optical biometers uh, like the uh, because most of them, uh, most of the biometers really gave a white to white that was larger than normal uh, or not larger than normal, but the measurements were larger than the manual uh, caliber measurements. And so what ended up happening was over time, a lot of different fudge factors for ICL uh, measurements were created to adapt to the fact that the biometers were giving a larger white to white than the manual calipers. And those fudge factors were okay, but they didn't, you know, they didn't always work. Um, with the accurate horizontal white to white measurements, um, we really don't have to use those fudge factors uh, almost at all anymore. Now, there are some other devices that you do need or may find helpful when you're doing uh, the ICL. Um, the endothelial uh, cell count, as we described, uh, specular microscopy uh, is still uh, recommended so that you can get endothelial cell counts to make sure that uh, your patient's endothelial cell counts are uh, close or, or, or to the FDA requirements. Uh, UBM ultrasound uh, is very, very uh, helpful to measure sulcus to sulcus uh, distance. So there are some uh, newer calculators uh, that use the sulcus to sulcus measurement, uh, which is actually where the ICL is being placed. So there's many reasons to believe that that might be the best measurement uh, for ICL sizing. Uh, but you do have to use alternative calculators uh, if you're going to use the sulcus uh, to sulcus measurement. Um, the STAR calculator itself, which is on uh, their uh, ordering platform, uh, really requires the horizontal uh, white to white. Uh, OCT, uh, which I don't have here, is still very helpful, uh, particularly in the post-op, uh, looking at vault uh, of the lens. Um, and of course, I throw this out there because even with auto refractions, even with our auto refractors becoming um, really pretty spot on in their refractions, uh, we still do depend on good uh, manual and in these cases, good cycloplegic refractions uh, before moving forward. Uh, with uh, the uh, ICL uh, choice. Uh, cyclopedic refractions, I still think, are, are, are very important, especially in this uh, patient population, uh, because uh, you tend to be many times dealing with more moderate and high myopes, and you can see quite a disparity uh, in those refractions in our younger patients. So this is a look at how the uh, calculator looks uh, when you're going to order an ICL. Um, STAR has done an excellent job at actually really making this calculator much more user friendly uh, than it used to be. Uh, so it is much easier to use. Uh, but what I want to highlight is the things that you do need to put in to be able to uh, choose and order an ICL lens. So you need to be able to put in the refraction of the patient. You have to put in the uh, corneal uh, curvature measurements, the steep and the flat uh, Ks with the axes. You have to be able to put the true anterior chamber depth, which as we've gone over is the internal anterior chamber depth, uh, central corneal thickness, which of course is provided by the Pentacam. And we went over uh, in detail the white to white, which is really the main uh, measurement, which the width of the ICL is based off of. And so what you can see is that with the Pentacam device and particularly with the AXL wave device, um, you can really generate uh, all of these measurements uh, with your one uh, exam. It, it really streamlines uh, your ICL planning. It allows you to uh, also confirm and be more reassured uh, about your numbers uh, when it comes to ICL planning. Uh, so you can feel more confident uh, about choosing uh, your lens size uh, and ICL size uh, for your patients. So I assume most people here have seen the ICL and seen ICL surgery, but I figured uh, I would just put a short video in. Uh, this isn't the entire surgery. Uh, I started here with lens, uh, with the lens placement. So this is through a three millimeter incision. Uh, now people are making them even less, 2.8 millimeters. The Leoli injector now uh, has made it a lot easier to load this, these lenses and, and insert them uh, through smaller uh, incisions. So that was a really nice change uh, for inserting the ICL. You can see the ICL is very large, so it comes out very smooth uh, when you place it, but it is a large lens. Um, and then we use this, I call it the dunker uh, device, uh, to place the foot plates um, behind the iris and in the sulcus uh, space. You really do want to make sure that you don't touch the optic at any point uh, during uh, placing these uh, foot plates. 
uh, of the lens. Uh, once you see that you kind of have that round pupil back, uh, you can be pretty assured uh, that the lens is in the sulcus space. And then this happens to be a toric ICL. So you do a little bit of rotation just to make sure that it is aligned. It's actually very easy to rotate, even though it's a large lens. I use bimanual IA to take out the OcuCoat. Um, you don't want to use it over the central port itself, um, but a lot of people just use manual uh, BSS to irrigate the OcuCoat out. With the ICL, uh, with the Evo ICL, it really does come out uh, really uh, nicely from behind the lens, somewhat through the central port and then somewhat around the lens. Uh, but you do want to take your time to make sure that you really remove uh, as much of the viscoelastic, as much of the OcuCoat as possible. Uh, because although the ICL, the Evo ICL is very forgiving, um, that can be uh, your source of early uh, pressure spikes with the lens. Um, and then you can uh, self uh, seal the corneal incisions uh, generally without any uh, suture. Now, the amazing thing about these lenses is that they really, from a vision standpoint, uh, have an incredibly fast visual recovery. So we have patients who, who are leaving uh, the uh, surgery center already seeing much better with the lens in place. Um, and by the time we check them a few hours later, we still do check our ICL patients a few hours later to do a pressure check, even with the Evo lens. Um, the patients are frequently seeing 2025 a few hours later, with many of them seeing 2020 already. So the visual recovery with the uh, ICL is incredibly, incredibly fast, um, which patients love. Post-op, uh, one of the main things you want to look at is the vault. Everything we just talked about is to try to size the ICL properly. You want to get the right refraction, of course, so that you pick the right power to the lens. And then you want to get the right width to the lens to make sure that it has an adequate vault uh, away from the crystalline lens. And we generally aim for a vault that's around between two and 700 microns. But the EVO ICL is more forgiving. Uh, we have a much, much wider tolerance uh, of vault with the EVO ICL. You can have uh, vaults that are 100 microns, even less than 100 microns, um, and patients do very, very well. You can have vaults that are over 700 microns um, where the IOP stays very, very stable um, and the lenses don't have to be exchanged. In those cases, actually, it's probably more important to look at the angle uh, and the remaining angle structure uh, to assess whether or not an ICL exchange uh, would be needed. And even that, uh, the Pentacam can give you some early assessment uh, of angle structure, both pre and post-op. So uh, one of the nice things is uh, on the uh, displays of the Pentacam, uh, you can see that this is a pre-op, a patient that I did ICL for. I had a very, very wide open, uh, large uh, angle. We placed the ICL, it did have a bit of a larger vault, but still a, a normal uh, angle uh, structure. And uh, this is a patient that we are not going to be uh, particularly concerned about as long as their IOP stays stable. So again, a very nice way of confirming what you're seeing at the slit lamp, uh, confirming what you're uh, checking uh, with Gonio, uh, but really gives you a, uh, a quick assessment and in the typical Oculus fashion, a really easy way uh, to display it and see uh, what you're looking at uh, from the anterior uh, segment perspective. Now, there are still cases where you have to exchange or, or remove an, an ICL. Um, I've had to remove uh, a couple, uh, two in particular, uh, of patients over uh, the years that I've done it uh, who had a persistent inflammation uh, from the lens. Um, we treated it for uh, many months. Um, it didn't uh, fully improve. Uh, but when I took out the ICL, uh, it went away. So. Um, that's one, again, one of the nice things about a reversible surgery uh, is that uh, when you are uh, doing surgery where you can remove the lens and you haven't done anything permanent uh, to the structure of the eye, um, for patients, it's frustrating, um, but they ascent their eye goes back to the way it was. And in general, there's no long-term uh, damage. So that's actually uh, very reassuring for patients. If the ICL vault is too large and you are seeing that the, in, that the pressure is uh, too high, uh, then that sh should uh, require a removal or likely just an exchange for a uh, smaller uh, lens. And if the vault is too low, uh, then we are concerned uh, that it's too close to the crystalline lens, which may induce cataract formation. Um, that may also necessitate exchange. 
Now, again, with the Evo lens, that is much less likely than it used to be. We have a much, much higher tolerance for shallow vaults uh, than we used to because we're really not seeing uh, cataract formation that's been induced uh, from the lens. And the European data, uh, which is longer than the US data, has confirmed that. Having said that, when you have vaults um, like on the bottom right that are just really incredibly shallow, um, you really have to have an extensive discussion with the patient um, about uh, the long-term uh, effects of that and watching it uh, versus exchanging it uh, for something uh, that will give you a little more room. Um, in that case, I would, I would probably uh, exchange the, the ICL uh, lens. But there are case reports of actually following these lenses uh, over pretty substantial periods of time uh, with still no cataract uh, formation uh, from the lens. So I do want to review a couple of cases, try to kind of highlight how we're using the ICL lens, um, highlight a little bit of uh, the Pentacam use uh, with it, um, and then uh, who we, we consider um, the ideal patients uh, for the ICL. So this uh, first case was a 27-year-old female who was having difficulty with her contact lenses. She was essentially wearing them uh, all day, 14 to 16 hours a day. She denied sleeping in the lenses. Um, but someone who's wearing them that long probably um, has at least a few nights uh, where they forget to take them out. Um, but she reports that her vision is so much worse in glasses um, that she can't really take uh, her lenses out. And so this patient is a, a high myope. Uh, her refraction is uh, minus 15 uh, with some astigmatism in the right eye, minus 13 and a half in the left eye. She's getting kind of a 20, 30, 20, 25 correction in her glasses. Uh, but as we all know, the quality of your glasses vision at that uh, level of myopia is just never uh, quite a, as good as your contact lenses. So patients really uh, just don't want to take their contact lenses out. And um, when we look at her uh, pentacams, uh, these are the just uh, four map refractive, what we're very used to looking at for, like I said, the backbone of our kind of refractive surgery uh, workup. Very normal uh, topography, very normal axial curvature, and then normal tomography with a no significant uh, anterior posterior elevation and normal thickness. Um, but the sweet spot here is, you know, she she is a high myope. Uh, we really there's no laser correction uh, to offer her even with a normal uh, thickness and cornea. Uh, historically, if you're going to offer a patient like this anything, you could offer it to maybe have uh, their prescription. Um, and then they would still have to wear glasses. And in this case, they're still going to be a pretty reasonable myope uh, if you do that. But the ICL has changed all that because the ICL really treats these patients with, with an incredibly, incredibly high quality vision. Um, and these are, are really some of our happiest uh, patients of all uh, because they really don't uh, wear glasses. They find contact lenses become more and more intolerant. Um, and they even find the quality of their vision with the ICL even better than the contact lens. So this is really a no-brainer uh, when it comes to refractive surgery. You know, this patient has no other real refractive options, um, and the ICL works great. Uh, the patient was basically 20-20 in both eyes um, and ecstatic from wearing the lens. So this was a 29-year-old who wanted to minimize their glasses and contact lenses, and I'm going to spill the beans a little bit. This is uh, Dr. Tulo's son. Um, and uh, he had a more typical kind of moderate myopic correction with some uh, kind of low moderate uh, astigmatism, good correction in glasses, good correction in contact lenses. Uh, so a much more typical kind of refractive patient that we're going to see. Uh, normal uh, topography, a regular uh, astigmatism, a good, thick, healthy uh, cornea. We look at the bad analysis, nothing jumps out uh, about the uh, cornea at all, completely normal. So the truth is this is a patient who you could uh, potentially offer LASIK to um, and would do very well. But what we're finding is actually more of and more patients uh, who are candidates for LASIK are actually asking uh, to have the ICL uh, done. And uh, I think, and we'll talk a little bit about why I think that that's happening. Um, but in a lot of these cases, I think it actually makes sense because uh, what we talked about um, really starts to happen when you get to these spherical equivalents of probably about minus seven, minus seven and a half, uh, definitely by minus eight and up, 
where you get that epithelial remodeling, you get those changes over time, and you do get this slight myopic regression. And epithelial remodeling is hard to treat because even when you do small enhancements, um, over time, the epithelium usually uh, re, uh, remodels again um, and kind of get sometimes get in this cycle where you end up sort of back at the same point. And I think, as we talked about, the ICL really uh, takes that away uh, in many ways. Um, and we have more and more patients uh, who are requesting it. Uh, and uh, Dr. Chulo just gave me uh, the most recent update just before we started. Uh, he's 2010 uh, in both eyes uh, and extremely happy. One thing that the AXL wave in particular can do uh, for Pentacam, this is an IOL, but same thing for the ICL, is there's a really nice uh, axis uh, alignment calculator uh, with on the retro illumination uh, image. So this is an IOL, uh, but I, see, I just didn't have a picture for the ICL yet right now, but, uh, but the Torque ICLs have a similar uh, marking on them. And you can actually really align the ICL uh, to determine the axis uh, of placement, which if you're trying to figure out about a residual refraction uh, that might uh, remain in some of your patients, particularly the toric patients, and trying to determine did the lens uh, spin a little bit, did it move uh, where you could see it and compare it over time, or does it just need to be uh, changed for a different uh, power, or does it need to be rotated uh, to be able to improve the refraction. Uh, the, uh, this uh, image and the ability to really very precisely identify the axis of your lens um, is incredibly helpful at making those decisions. Very helpful with TORC IOLs and very helpful as well uh, with TORC ICLs. So we've talked about kind of a case of the high myope, that's sort of almost the low hanging fruit uh, of ICL normal myope with astigmatism who wants the ICL. And here are some more unique uh, cases where I think the ICL really uh, shines uh, as a refractive option. So this was a 33-year-old patient who I saw, typical refractive evaluation, wants to minimize their glasses and contact lens. And the one key component for uh, this patient is a history of keloid formation. So pretty aggressive keloid former. Um, now, historically, uh, in terms of keloid formation uh, with laser correction, particularly with uh, PRK correction, um, it is uh, a, a somewhat soft contraindication to doing laser correction as there was uh, a case of keloid formation in the early FDA trials. Um, I would say that and, you know, in our practice, we've done uh, both LASIK and, and PRK uh, on patients who are keloid formers, um, and I've actually never seen a keloid formation happen from a PRK a procedure. Um, but it is something to always keep in the back of our minds. And I do tell patients who are keloid formers um, that it is certainly not out of the realm of possibility that it could happen. So this patient uh, is also a kind of a moderate myope, a little bit less astigmatism, good correction. And the main thing uh, for this patient is they do have a thinner cornea. So with their uh, moderate myopia, with a little bit of astigmatism, their corneal thickness uh, is about four, it's 479 in the right eye, 475 in the left eye. And when we do look uh, more deeply at the bad analysis, uh, we can see that particularly because of their thickness profile, um, they're uh, kind of an intermediate and a, and a use caution uh, sign for uh, laser uh, correction. So this is definitely a patient I would not recommend doing LASIK for. And so from a laser perspective, uh, or smile for that matter, so for uh, from, a, from a laser correction perspective, uh, really PRK is the only option that I would be comfortable uh, discussing with this patient. And again, with history of keloid formation, um, which I think is something that needs to be discussed, and this was someone who was an aggressive a keloid former. Um, it's, it is always in the back of my mind uh, about that possibility uh, in a post-operative healing. So I had an extensive discussion uh, with, with this patient and we actually decided that the uh, ICL, I thought would be the best option for them. Very little induced healing uh, with the ICL. You're gonna make a small peripheral corneal incision. Uh, and other than that, I think the risk of keloid formation here um, is really going to be minuscule. Um, and this patient did opt to have the ICL done. And in addition, as a 
it is a more LASIK-like recovery, uh, which our patients very much appreciate, in that their vision is going to be better that day. And most of them are driving and doing their normal activity uh, within 24 hours, where as with PRK, um, it definitely is a longer road uh, with more ups and downs. So this patient also elected uh, to do ICL um, and did very well. Another place where uh, I've started to use uh, and find the ICL to be an incredibly uh, helpful refractive option for our patients uh, is in a case like this. So this was a, a 28 year old male, similar refraction to what we've uh, gone over a few times. It uh, corrects pretty well. So it corrects to about 2025 20, in the right eye a little better uh, and uh, kind of a, a fuzzy 2020 20 in the left. So, uh, little bit uh, off on the uh, correction. And again, I put in the uh, full sequence overview here. This patient actually I saw before we had the retroillumination and aberometry uh, testing, uh, so that would uh, normally be here. But what I really want to highlight is on this uh, map, you can very, very quickly take a look and see that he has a thin cornea. Uh, the corneas definitely have some inferior steepening and some uh, posterior elevation. And on the bad analysis, it is flagging actually in red. So this is somebody who has a cornea uh, that is uh, pretty significantly out of the norm and you need to figure out why. So when we put and look at our four maps refractive, uh, we can see why this patient flags the way they do. They have a mild keratoconus. Uh, this patient actually been offered uh, elsewhere a, a PRK uh, with, with cross-linking but uh, decided to see if there were other options. And we had discussed uh, doing cross-linking first in both eyes to stabilize the cornea. Also, if that's going to induce any refractive change, uh, I wanna know that before doing any kind of refractive surgery. So we did cross-linking in both eyes. We actually waited a full year and then uh, did ICL uh, surgery in both eyes uh, for him. And he actually uh, did better with the ICL than he was doing in his contact lenses. He was essentially a 2020 uh, in both eyes. And the ICL really can shine uh, in these patients because these are the patients we want to touch their cornea the least. Um, but he has really good correction with his mild keratoconus and uh, has, is doing incredibly well uh, with an ICL, better than I think he would have done um, for sure with any kind of uh, laser uh, correction. And the Pentacam in particular uh, is a great device uh, to be able to kind of get all of the measurements that you need for a patient like this, uh, both to screen them, to educate them, to pick the right surgery for them, and then to pick the right lens as well. So finally, to, to wrap up, I want to kind of show more of like a, a fun case uh, when it comes to keratoconus. Um, so I guess it depends on the definition of fun. but. Um, this is a 33-year-old male uh, who had keratoconus uh, in both eyes, significant anisometropia uh, with uh, poor correction, at least spectacle correction in the right eye. So we can see on their maps, a very uh, asymmetric uh, keratoconus, uh, which we see uh, fairly frequently um, in our uh, patient uh, population that comes here. And um, <clears throat> the first thing we did was cross-linking. So we did cross-link uh, both corneas uh, to stabilize his cornea. Then we looked at the right uh, cornea and he really, really wanted something because he has such good spectacle correction in his left eye. He really didn't want to wear a contact lens in the one eye uh, with glasses over the top and he was not interested in contact lenses for his left eye. So we started uh, as the next step to try to improve his uh, corneal topography and we had placed a uh, Intex uh, years ago. Now this would be a uh, corneal uh, inlay uh, likely CTAC. And then uh, he improved, you can see the topography improved, uh, but still wasn't quite as regular as we wanted. So we did a topography guided uh, PRK on his cornea. We had already done cross-linking, so we felt comfortable doing the mild PRK without any additional cross-linking. Um, and you can see how much more regular we've now made the cornea. So we've made his right cornea very similar to his left. And from before surgery to after his, uh, the laser was done, his glasses correction improved from 2080 uh, to 2025. But he's still pretty anisometropic. So while we uh, corrected him, he still really can't wear glasses with that uh, prescription. 
and uh, his uncorrected vision um, is very different between his two eyes. So with now toric uh, ICLs and the ability to correct a lot of this refraction without having to do any more corneal surgery, that really offers us the opportunity for this patient to give him uh, a much less uh, anisometropia between his eyes. Because really, from a, we cannot perform this much corneal surgery uh, with a laser, uh, an eczema laser, uh, on somebody with this level of keratoconus. So we did the ICL for, uh, for this patient, uh, and their vision uh, improved uh, to 2030 uncorrected, 2025 in glasses, uh, with uh, essentially almost a, a plane of spherical equivalent. So now if you look at his two eyes, his uncorrected vision is, is equal uh, and essentially 2025 and 2030 in both. He has good uh, spectacle uh, correction uh, in both eyes. And so really show the ICL here really gave this patient, even with all the other surgery we did, the true refractive opportunity. Uh, and really was we were able to meet his ultimate goals uh, for vision correction. So who do I think are some of the ideal candidates for uh, the EVO ICL? Well, that's really something that's changing uh, because there are so many patients now who are candidates. And as I said, we have more and more patients who are coming in uh, asking uh, for the EVO ICL. And I think it's a great primary option for those patients. I think as you get to moderate and high myopia, and that number is coming down and down where we're defining that moderate level, I think it's a really strong uh, option uh, for those patients. As we've gone over, I think the epithelial remodeling is a real factor uh, in long-term stability of refractions, and I think the ICL really shines uh, for that. Patients who aren't a candidate for really LASIK more than laser correction entirely, or laser correction in general. Uh, so our PRK patients who uh, really don't want to go through the healing process of PRK. They don't want to go through the ups and downs uh, of it. It takes a few weeks for them to really get uh, their vision to uh, really the crisp level of vision that they're looking for. Uh, we all know from our PRK patients what it's like managing them through that. The EVO ICL shines in those patients. Many of them really want uh, to have this done uh, because it gives them that LASIK-like recovery, uh, some ways faster than LASIK. Um, and they don't have to go through any of the healing process. Keratoconus is another place that we really found uh, the EVO ICL to shine. I actually wish it was available in lower diopters uh, than it currently is uh, to be able to use it in our keratoconus patients, because especially now with cross-linking, our ability to reshape the corneas very effectively, but still be left with remaining refractions, um, the ICL is a great, great option for those patients. And what I found to be uh, the most interesting is the reversibility of the ICL is really a big, um, uh, is something that patients really uh, appreciate and they're, they're incredibly interested in uh, when you talk to them about it. So it's not something I really anticipated until I uh, started talking to patients more and more about it. Um, but patients actually like the idea that you're not doing any permanent change to their eye um, and that uh, you can take this out at any point they wanted. So if they didn't like that they had too much glare and halo, you could actually take the lens out and it would go away. But even more important is it gives them the opportunity for technolo technology to improve over time, which I find the patients are very interested in. So when I talk to them about, you know, presbyopic uh, corrections and presbyopic improvements are changing over time with improved technology, they love the idea that maybe you could take this out and replace it with a future presbyopic correcting uh, lens and future cataract surgery. Uh, there's Because you're not changing anything about the curvature of the cornea, you really, your IOL options, your future IOL options, uh, which is always an evolving technology, it, are all open to you uh, with ICL surgery. So I, I found the reversibility of it to be a real, uh, real positive uh, for our uh, patients choosing the ICL. What are patients' concerns about it? Where do, where do we meet pushback on it? So definitely there's fear of the unknown. Um, there's fear of putting, when you tell patients for the first time you're going to put uh, a lens inside their eye, the first time most patients hear that, if they have not heard of the ICL, there's definitely that kind of early wince in, in, in their reaction. They, they want to hear more, um, but they're not sure how they feel about that. Um, and a lot of them have only heard of LASIK. I mean, still to this day, uh, LASIK is the known 
uh, refractive procedure. It's kind of everything is lumped under the LASIK uh, header, the LASIK title. Uh, and you're talking to patients frequently about the front and the first time that they're hearing about the surgery. So there's a lot more patient education uh, that you need to do uh, to really get these patients <clears throat> to understand the ICL as a refractive option. And cost is still a real factor uh, that we find for uh, ICL patients. The uh, ICLs uh, and the cost of doing the ICL surgeries is more expensive. Um, and so that does generally get passed along uh, to the patients. And so the fees for this surgery are more, uh, are more expensive. Uh, Office-based surgery uh, has changed that uh, to some degree. It has definitely made the ability to offer the surgery uh, at a more affordable cost. Um, it has definitely offered that opportunity to patients. Uh, but even with office-based surgery, uh, generally the cost of doing ICL uh, is more expensive than doing laser correction. And clearly there are patients uh, who have pushback um, or just are uncomfortable uh, with that. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, I do think that the Pentacam is really a unique device in the sense that it provides a very reproducible uh, data uh, that we need to perform successful ICL surgery by getting uh, reproducible and accurate um, measurements uh, to, to measure the uh, width uh, of the white to white in particular, uh, so that we can get the right measurements uh, for the ICL uh, lens. Uh, the AXL Wave, uh, which is the newest um, in the line of Pentacams, uh, can really further streamline your uh, EVO ICL workflow uh, because as I've showed you uh, from the beginning, you can really get almost everything you need uh, for your ICL calculator uh, off of the uh, AXL Wave. And even evaluating patients post-op, uh, can you could be aided uh, and comforted by some of the uh, ability to measure the anterior segment uh, with both the Pentacams uh, in general and particularly uh, the AXL uh, wave. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully uh, that was uh, uh, informative on, on the ICL. It is a, a something that we uh, really are, are passionate about uh, here. We've uh, really seen great results with it and uh, our patients have been really, really happy with it. Great information, Stephen. Thank you so much. And we have some good questions that have come in. Um, first question I'd like to ask you, um, talk a little bit about the age range for the candidacy for the product. I know there's a label and can you talk a little bit about what the on-label indications are for age and what do you feel comfortable going in either younger or older patients off the label? Sure. So, I mean, the, the, it's approved from 21 to 45. Um, so pretty, pretty wide range for our refractive corrections. I think in terms of going younger, the younger conversation is very similar to any refractive conversation that we have, which is um, I talk to patients, you know, who are 18, 19 years old uh, about refractive surgery, and I'm pretty open and honest with them. You know, I will tell them that you're, uh, you haven't reached ocular maturity yet. Uh, it's possible that your prescription is not going to change, but we have seen, but we have seen many patients have still changes in their uh, prescription uh, when they go to college. Um, and there's no way that any of these procedures is going to stop that. So uh, if you are going to have refractive surgery now, there is a reasonable chance uh, that you're going to need some kind of enhancement uh, down the road. Now with the ICL, you have some room to do laser enhancement if it's a small correction, and you could exchange it uh, because you're not doing any permanent uh, change to thickness of the corner. You don't run out of room uh, to do the enhancements if needed. So that is a comforting factor to it. And the one thing in the younger age range is, you know, they are probably our most abusive contact lens wearers. Uh, so if they're somebody who already in high school is uh, poor about their contact lens hygiene, um, it is only going to get worse when they go to college. Uh, so those patients, I feel more strongly benefit from refractive surgery at that point um, because their chances of risks in contact lens wear in those cases are higher. Um, but I do want patients to be comfortable with the idea that their prescription has a high chance of changing. And if they're not comfortable with that, they definitely need and should wait uh, for, for stability uh, after college. In the older age range, that's what I find most interesting with the ICL, which is we have definitely started to feel much more comfortable going older than 45. Uh, we were always concerned about going older because with the uh, crystalline lens getting larger and larger over time and the vault potentially shrinking over time, 
that would increase your risk of cataract formation. And if you put it in somebody who's 47, 48, um, they'd love it. But if they get cataract at 55 uh, from it, um, while that's very treatable and they may accept that risk, uh, you know, that, that's something that, uh, that they really had to, to think about. Because the incidence of cataract formation has really dropped so much and there's much more tolerance of a shallower vault, um, I don't have that concern as much. I think that they can get much more longevity uh, out of the ICL lens. So I think they can get, you know, 15, even years plus with it um, uh, before they'd have to have cataract surgery potentially anyways um, for their refractive correction. And there you can take advantage of their accommodation with some blended vision um, and still remove the lens at any point and do refractive lens exchange or cataract surgery without affecting your measurements. So uh, on the older end, uh, I'd be comfortable at this point, uh, definitely going up uh, to 50. And we're really pushing the envelope on that. I mean, even mid fifties, um, if their lens is very, very clear, um, is it, 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 it's, it's a reasonable uh, option. Excellent. Uh Stephen, can you comment a little bit on the post-op care? Um, how does it differ from typical LASIK PRK post-op care? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it kind of somewhere between LASIK and uh, cataract surgery when it comes to post-op care. Um, from, the, from the standpoint of visits, it's actually the same. We see patients generally the next day, a week, usually a month, and a few months later to just confirm that their kind of refraction is stable and determine if they need anything else done for any residual refraction. Um, the changes with typical care at LASIK care is you do check, I still check their pressure a few hours, even with the EVO lens, a few hours after the surgery is done. So all patients kind of have the surgery done. I tell them to go get something to eat um, and then come back to the office to check their pressure uh, before uh, they leave for the day. Uh, on the next day uh, and, and after that, the real extra thing you're checking for is the vaults. Um, so you want to make sure that your vault is adequate. Um, and not too shallow, not too large, um, and that the pressure in the eye, the intraocular pressure um, is uh, remaining normal, which again, with the EVO lens has become much less of a problem. Uh, those are the extra things you're really looking for, wound being side del negative, you know, things like that early on. Um, and then it becomes very much like a typical refractive follow-up. And on your annual exams, years, year, year, year by year annual, do you expect the vault to change significantly year over year? Year to year, no. Um, year to year, we don't tend to see major changes in the vault. I think over extended periods of time, uh, you'll see some change in the vault, usually because of changes to the uh, to the lens. But um, year to year, no. We have a very patient specific question that I'll I'll read off to you. Okay. Um, this doctor has a patient, it's a year out of EVO with pigment forming on the ICL, no inflammation, IOP is normal, uh, gonio and angles are open. Um, there's a little more pigment in the trabecular meshwork in the eye with the pigment on the ICL. Is there any need for an exchange or should I just watch it? I would just watch it. I, I, so I, interestingly enough, had had this conversation very recently um, with, with another uh, ICL surgeon as well. Um, I have seen it as well. Um, it does. It's particularly on these patients who have these very thick uh, brown irises. Um, as long as the there's no inflammation, as long as the anterior chamber is quiet and the pressure is uh, is uh, okay, um, I, I would just watch it. All right. So I have a question here that's that I'm going to actually get involved in. I'm going to ask it to you, but I'm going to comment a little bit before you answer it. And it's and you talked about this during your presentation of how the visual outcomes with Evo ICL compare to other refractive surgeries like LASIK, PRK, and Smile. Um, and I just want to mention about your your case number two, which was my younger son. Um, clearly, a lot of people that I've worked with in the past found out that my son did not get LASIK and he got ICL. And they asked me, well, Bill, why? You, you were working with LASIK for 25 years. Why did your son not get LASIK? Was he a thin cornea? Was he a bad candidate? And um, I think the, the answer is an interesting answer because I obviously I put a lot of thought into um, what procedure I felt was best for my son. And as, as you saw, his spherical equivalent was about a 7, 7, 750 in each eye. Um, so he clearly was it, within the range of LASIK. But when you look carefully at LASIK and PRK and even SMILE outcomes, the efficacy changes with the spherical equivalent. 
as you go higher and higher, when you go from a five to a six to a seven to an eight, there's clearly a de decrease in efficacy. And when you look at the ICL, the efficacy is independent of the prescription. Um, there is no loss of efficacy as you go higher in number. So I just felt like the break even point um, when I looked at mega data outcomes um, from minus sevens, generally they just did better with, with ICLs. And there was no other reason or contraindication that I couldn't have asked you to do LASIK on him. But I just felt that, you know, the epithelium is not involved. I don't have to worry about that high, the hypertrophic epithelium years later. Um, and he's already got 10 years of accommodation left. He's got a lot, a lot of time to worry about that. So I felt that really it's that lack of loss of efficacy over, over uh, spherical equivalent was my primary reason. Um, and the other thing that I'll mention also, and I don't know why he's 2010 in each eye because he wore soft toric lenses, he wore gas permeable <laughs> lenses, he even had ortho K for two years, and he never had better than 2015. In fact, he often had 2020, 2020 plus. Um, I think there's something with the nodal point and putting the optics at the nodal point that a lot of these patients gain a line of vision. And, and my son was fortunate enough to gain a line of vision in each eye also. Um, so can you just comment about that? And does, does that go into your consideration? You have a lot of patients in your practice coming asking for LASIK. And, and does that conversation come into play with your patients? Yeah, ab absolutely. So as I kind of referenced a little bit, you know, the, the threshold that I have looked at that I consider now sort of a higher moderate myopia for and may benefit from ICL keeps uh, decreasing because, as you said, um, you know, we all know that as the uh, my as the level of myopia increases, uh, both your spot on the correction itself um, is uh, less and less uh, predictable. Um, but I really look at it less from that first uh, treatment um, and more kind of in the in the general sort of um, picture of what you're doing. So as you increase your treatment, even with blended zones, uh, topography guided laser, uh, all of the great advancements we've had in laser correction, and we, and we do a lot of laser correction here, um, as you get higher and higher in your correction, uh, there's no question that there is there is more change in the shape of the cornea, and that does affect the quality of vision. And again, most of our patients have accepted those changes because they are so happy with the fact that they were a minus seven, and now they're 20, 20, um, and they don't need their glasses, they don't need their contacts. But as you flatten the cornea more and more, there's no question that there is some, and for everybody it is different, uh, effect on their quality of vision. And I really do believe that when you're keeping the curvature of the cornea in its natural shape. And like you said, you are adding uh, something to its the nodal point uh, within the eye. I think the quality of the vision when you get to these moderate and higher corrections is better. Um, I, I think it is that that's just the feedback that I, I feel like I, I get from these patients. Um, and so I don't have any data you know, on that uh, uh, now, but it's, it's, it's an anecdotal feel uh, that I have uh, uh, treating patients. So that's why that number has really uh, come down over the years. And certainly, as I've you know, highlighted many times in, in, in this presentation, I, I think epithelial remodeling is a real uh, challenge uh, when it comes to my higher myopic corrections, even moderate myopic corrections. Um, it's always been that way. Um, it's something that you know, once you see it, it's, it is hard to enhance um, and, and treat. Um, and so I just, I just don't think it's it really you know it's just not an issue when you place the ICL. Well, Steve, and outside thank you the US, so much. The outside yeah. the US, it's become like the go-to uh, procedure at, at almost uh, every myopic correction in certain in certain areas uh, internationally. Um, I think because of that. Yeah, I just got back from ESCRS and it shocked me talking to a lot of international surgeons that the uh, the percentage of ICL procedures in their practice was more than double what a typical U.S. surgeon is. So, oh, sure. Um, and part of that is because the Evo has been available for a decade outside the U.S. And they also and, have uh, it too. They have Evo available at very low degrees of myopic correction. So, you know, they're using it actually sometimes in enhancement. So if you've had LASIK done years right. ago, you get that minus one and a half. Um, you don't want to deal with, you know, the epithelial changes. They're using ICL even for that, so that they have a little bit more of it available. Exactly. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing all this information with us tonight. This was very informative. And thank everyone for joining us tonight. And um, 
uh, recordings will become available in about a week. Uh, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Right. Everyone. Good night, everybody.